So, as I said, I know some of you have seen this before, but can anybody tell me what kind of bird this is? Lois, you're not allowed to answer because I know you know the answer to this question. Anyone? Thoughts in the chat? Swainson's thrush? It's not a Swainson's thrush, but that's a good guess. It is a thrush. Very good guess. Oh, we got an answer in the chat. Uh, nope. It's not a hermit thrush either. No. What's our third option here, basically? Oh my gosh. Hmm? The gray cheeked. No, it's not yeah. gray cheeked either. It is a gray cheeked thrush. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I had the same reaction, uh, but it's Derek Whitaker's photo. So he assures me it is a gray cheeked thrush. And uh, I always start presentations with a story about the gray cheeked thrush. Uh, and the reason is this. So I don't know if you guys are aware. Let's, there we go. Uh, but gray cheeked thrush in Newfoundland are actually genetically distinct from the subspecies of gray cheeked thrush that spread all across uh, northern North America. So right here we have a unique subspecies called the Newfoundland gray cheeked thrush. And because of that, uh, in 2005, Derek Whitaker, who some of you may know is a biologist at Gross Morn, was asked to, uh, to evaluate the status of this unique population that we had. And he accepted this contract and then found that it was a lot more difficult than he thought it was going to be. And the reason for this is that we were just lacking information. So during the late 70s and early 80s, we had a lot of breeding bird surveys done in Newfoundland. And uh, what we were hearing from these breeding bird surveys is that if you look at the data, gray cheek thrush were actually reasonably common along the roots. However, after about 1984, breeding bird surveys almost came to a complete halt in, in Newfoundland. And so we really didn't know what was going on with the gray cheek thrush after that. What Derek was hearing from birders is that uh, they, were, they were finding, sorry, I'm just admitting someone from the reading room. So birders were saying that the gray cheek thrush was less common uh, now than it had been previously, but there just wasn't any actual data for Derek to, to discover whether or not that was the case. And so he wrote this status report in 2005 that ended up being fairly equivocal. He wasn't really sure. He said, we suspect there's a decline, but we don't have enough evidence to back that up. However, in the early 2000s, Canadian Wildlife Service worked really hard to reestablish breeding bird survey routes in Newfoundland. And what they found when they did that is that there was this massive decline in gray cheeked thrush uh, on the island. Uh, in some cases, we had a 95% decline in some of the coastal breeding bird survey routes, which is obviously a massive decline. And so Derek asked to rewrite the status report uh, in 2010. And as a result of that, gray cheeked thrush are now listed as threatened under the Provincial Endangered Species Act. And they are, uh, I believe they're on the schedule to be assessed by the Committee for the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada or CACWIC. So they might end up being federally listed as well. So I really like this story. It's obviously not a great story for the gray cheek thrush, uh, but it is a really good illustration of why it's so important for us to have baseline data on bird populations. We can't know what we're losing or even what we're gaining in some cases if we don't know what's out there. And that's obviously what we try and do with a breeding bird atlas. So many of you are probably familiar with breeding bird atlases, but for those of you who aren't, what they are is a comprehensive systematic assessment of the distribution and the abundance of breeding bird species in a jurisdiction, so usually a province or a state, and it's done over a five year period. So you have this five year snapshot of what's going on with the birds in a particular province. Um, and I have pictures up there of some of our somewhat recent breeding bird atlases. Uh, they used to be published in these absolutely gorgeous books like this. And actually Quebec's most recent breeding bird atlas was still a book. However, most of us have now moved to online breeding bird atlases. Uh, so this is the most recently completed atlas, the Atlas of the Breeding Birds of Manitoba. And this is their webpage and it's an online book. Um, this is great because although we do miss the beautifully illustrated coffee table books that we had in big sizable books, um, this makes the data more accessible to anyone. So you don't need to buy this. You can, anybody can access this on the web. The core of these breeding bird atlases are these species accounts. So there's one of these for every uh, bird species found breeding in Manitoba. 
And each of them will have a picture of the species, usually taken by an atlaser while collecting data for the atlas. Then they'll have a little bit of a write-up about the species. And then down here in the corner, you can see these maps. And those are really the core of the atlas. Uh, so these are the two most important maps. On the left there, you have the breeding distribution of bobolink. So every atlas square where bobolink were observed breeding. And then on the right, you have the relative abundance. And we'll come back to those two different types of data later. One of the other things that I really like to highlight about these uh, online atlases is the fact that uh, you can do something with them that you can't do with the paper atlases. So the paper atlases also have those species accounts. But the cool thing about the online data, online atlases, is that you can search by location. So if, for example, I were lucky enough to be going to Churchill, Manitoba, I could figure out which square that was in. I could search for the square and it would generate for me a list of all of the birds that were observed breeding in that square. So then I know what to look for while I'm in Churchill. Um, and that's that's a really neat ability that you have with these online atlases. So that's what we're aiming to create. Um, something else worth noting is that because atlases have been done in so many Canadian provinces, we also have the, the ability to combine data from all of these atlases. Uh, so this is data on the distribution of the rusty blackbird in Canada uh, from breeding bird atlases done in BC, in Manitoba, in Ontario, in Quebec. Uh, you will notice that according to this map, there are no rusty blackbirds in Newfoundland and Labrador, which we know is not true. You'll also notice that they stop in a straight line halfway up uh, through Quebec, and I'm pretty sure you can guess that's not true too, which really leads me to the next point. These are data gaps that we are working to fill in. Uh, so currently, Newfoundland and Labrador is the only province that lacks a modern breeding bird atlas. So the map that you see there is a little bit old. Uh, since it was created, Saskatchewan has in fact launched and this year are finishing their five-year data collection window for a breeding bird atlas. Uh, Quebec has now done their second atlas and they're working on a second atlas for the northern part of the province. So right now, Newfoundland and Labrador is a big gap in our understanding of the status and the distribution of birds in Canada. And this is, of course, the gap that we are working to fill. Uh, with the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Now, uh, some of you may be wondering, what about Labrador? Uh, it's not called the NL Breeding Bird Atlas. It's called the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Uh, we are not currently covering Labrador. It would be great to see a Labrador Atlas in the future, but we're uh, trying to take on one enormous challenge at a time. So right now we are only atlasing insular Newfoundland. Um, this is a hugely collaborative project. Uh, so we have a number of partner organizations, which you can see across the top there. We work very closely with Canadian Wildlife Service, the provincial government, Parks Canada, MUN, uh, the Stewardship Associ Association of Municipalities, uh, the EHJV. And then we also have ties with the Humber Natural History Society, uh, as Lois will attest to, as well as Nature NL, uh, and a number of other supporters. So breeding bird atlases are definitely not a single organization thing. It's, uh, it's a multi-organizational effort for sure, because it's just such a huge project. Uh, however, this one is being led by Birds Canada, and many of you are probably familiar with Birds Canada. Uh, but for those of you who are not, we are the uh, leading science-based conservation, bird conservation organization in the country. And our mission is to advance the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of wild birds and their habitats in Canada. And so to do this, we have a wide variety of programs. I know at least a few people here recently participated in our nocturnal owl survey program. Um, and one of the really neat things about Birds Canada programs is that they're almost all citizen science based. So really we are very dependent on volunteers and their skills. Uh, and so each year more than 30,000 volunteers participate in Birds Canada programs across the country, which is really a phenomenal number if, if you think about it. So we're leading this atlas in Newfoundland. Our goal, as I said, is to map the distribution and the abundance of Newfoundland's breeding birds. As I said, atlases are a five-year time window, so a snapshot of what's happening somewhere over five years. Our atlas runs from 2020 to 2024, so we are entering our second year of data collection this summer, which is actually kind of mind-boggling to me. Um, the peak season of data collection is early June to early July. Uh, I'm going to come back to that date range because I, I want to emphasize that's not the only time we collect data, that's just when we're busiest. So the atlas design, um, a few slides ago, I mentioned an atlas square. 
Uh, so Atlas Squares, oops, we've got something in the chat. What have we got here? Uh, how can you get involved? Wayne, we will definitely get to that. Um, hang in there. And if I if you still have that question at the end, ask it again and, uh, and we will definitely talk, but I'm thrilled to have you here. Um, okay, so Atlas Squares are the basic <laughs> unit of atlasing. Um, Kathy, if it's okay, I'm just gonna mute you because I think we're getting a little feedback from you uh, and you should be able to unmute yourself if you need to. Um, so Atlas squares are 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer squares. Uh, so that's, we've divided the island of Newfoundland up into these squares that works out to 1,485 squares in total. This is a number I see in my sleep, believe me. We have basically proportioned those squares into eight regions. Uh, so one of those regions you will notice is St. Pierre and Miquelon, seven of them are on the island of Newfoundland. And each of those regions is managed by a regional coordinator. And we're lucky enough uh, here to have one of the regional coordinators for region two, Lois Bateman. Um, so these regional coordinators, they act as the liaison between the volunteers in the region and the Atlas office. So they really help to, uh, to organize efforts at a local level. You'll also see on that map there that there are a whole bunch of black and white dots. And what those indicate are priority squares. Now, when I say priority squares, it's not like we looked for the most interesting places to go birding and chose those, because obviously from a scientific perspective, that would raise some major concerns. What we wanna do with these priority squares is ensure that we have even coverage of the island. So what we don't want at the end of five years is to discover that we've covered every square on the Avalon all along the western edge of the Northern Peninsula and uh, Southwestern Newfoundland there. And then we have gigantic gaps in the middle. So we're really trying to avoid that situation. And so we've designated uh, systematically about 25% of our squares as priority one squares, and then an additional 15% as priority two squares. And these are the squares that we're really aiming to get coverage of. Um, it's unlikely that we are going to get full coverage of nearly 1500 squares. So that's where we want people to focus their efforts, those priority squares. All right. So the different types of data that you can collect as part of the, the breeding bird atlas are incidental observations, general atlasing, and point counts. And I'm just gonna go through each of those relatively briefly. And then if you have questions, you can feel free to ask them. So first we have incidental observations. And essentially this just means any bird anywhere if you're not out birding. So let's say you're going for a drive and you happen to notice a pair of loons with a, with a chick in a lake. That's breeding evidence. That, that indicates that those loons were probably breeding there. And so that is information you can put into the atlas even though what you were doing at the time was probably going to get groceries, not uh, specifically looking for birds. So the peak season for this, you'll remember that I said our busiest season is the 7th of June to the 7th of July, but the peak season for incidental observations is actually much wider than that. It's late May to mid August because that's when most birds are breeding. And I say that, but I'm also gonna emphasize that some birds breed before or after that. So uh, anybody who's just on the owl survey knows that owls are already breeding. Uh, they were breeding in April, some of them even in March. Uh, and so technically, the atlas is open to data submission year round. If you see breeding evidence for something any time of the year, you can submit it. The only reason we say the incidental observation season is primarily from late May to mid August is because that's when the majority of species are breeding. Incidental observations tell us about presence. So if you see a pair of loons on a lake, that tells us that loons are present in breeding in that square. What it doesn't tell us is whether loons are present or absent from the surrounding squares. So we don't get presence and absence data, we just get presence data from incidental observations. And the key thing to note about incidental observations is there is no measure of effort associated with them. So you don't need to say how long you were birding, um, you know, how, how much ground you covered. It's just, I saw this here. That's basically what you're submitting with incidental observations. General atlasing is sort of the next step up. And so this is basically birding within a square. Think of it as birding with the extra component of breeding evidence. And this is a term I've mentioned several times and something we'll come back to. So for each of those 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer squares, we have a target of 12 to 20 hours of birding within the, within the square. And at that point we call it complete because we figure we've discovered most of the things that there are to discover there. 
Uh, you'll notice that's a pretty big range, 12 to 20 hours. A lot of that is based on the experience of the atlaser. So some people have been birding for 30 years. They know everything like the back of their hand. They probably are going to discover everything there is to be discovered within a square within 12 hours. If you're newer to birding and just getting started, you might need to take a little bit longer to make sure that you've got everything there is to see in a square. Uh, there are other metrics to look at square completions, so we can look at it in terms of number of expected species or proportion of expected species that have been discovered. Uh, so sometimes we do that, but as a rough target to aim for, think between 12 and 20 hours. Uh, the main season for general atlasing is also from late May to mid-August with exactly the same caveat as I had for incidental observations, which is, you know, if you see something breeding, any, sorry, if you see a bird breeding any time of year, then that's information that can go into the atlas. And general atlasing provides information on both presence and absence. So if you spend 20 hours in a square searching and you didn't find something, we have a little bit more confidence that it's not there. When you're doing general atlasing, an incredibly helpful tool is these square maps, which I showed on the last screen, but I, I wanted you to get a slightly closer up view of them. So these square maps uh, show you the different types of habitat. So you can see in the, the legend here, uh, they show you this square is roughly 43% broadleaf forest, 2% coniferous forest, 30%, 7% mixed wood forest. And that's really useful information to have because that's also how we'd like you to divide your effort. So when you're surveying a square, spend roughly a proportional amount of time in those habitat types. Uh, don't decide that shrubland is easier to walk through and so you're just gonna spend your time in the shrubland because obviously then you're gonna miss things. Um, the other thing that you can see on these maps are the roads. Uh, so you can see highways, regional or local roads, resource recreation roads. I will say, that uh, these maps were developed by our incredibly brilliant GIS team uh, at our headquarters, which is in Ontario. And we didn't necessarily have the best roadmap information. So I can tell you myself from doing some atlasing last summer that sometimes those road designations are a little overly optimistic. And so you may find that something you thought you could drive on is not in fact something you can drive on. Uh, just something to be aware of when you're planning these things out. Um, you'll notice there, there are also these little points indicated on the, the map, and those are points for point counts. And that's our third kind of data selection or data um, type, data collection type, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, but you can also see the points are listed there. Um, there are 30 of them and that you have the GPS coordinates for them. Okay, square assignments. I really wanted to focus on this as well. So when you sign up for a square, what that means is that you are committing to completing those 12 to 20 hours of general atlasing required. That's over five years, that's not within one year. Uh, so it's, you know, it's not actually that much time when you look at it over five years, but it, it means that you are essentially committing to completing the general atlasing coverage for that square. It absolutely does not mean you can only submit data for that square. We will take data from anybody for any square. It also does not mean others can't submit data from your square, uh, which I don't think would be an issue here, but there, there have occasionally been problems when people are offended that somebody else is submitting information for their square. So as I said, breeding bird atlases are a very collaborative effort um, and anybody can submit data from any square. But square assignments really help the regional coordinators to organize the effort. So to make sure that they're spreading their volunteers out uh, and getting the best coverage possible. It is not required to take on a square. You do not need to sign up for a square to participate in the Atlas. You can participate in the Atlas even if you only have one observation a year you wanna submit, that's fine. Uh, but they are really helpful for us. So if you are, are more interested in, in being a bit more committed, then talk to the regional coordinator for the region that you are looking at signing up for a square in. Um, and that is, uh, that is available on the website, the contact information for all the regional coordinators. Last type of data, the point counts. So some of you may have done point counts before. They are exactly what they sound like. They're timed counts at these predetermined locations. So you stand at a location, uh, for us it's five minutes, and you record all the birds that you see and hear. Uh, as many of us know, birds are much more often heard than seen. So a lot of this involves birding by ear. Um, 
while we encourage everyone to participate in the atlas, point counts are really uh, something that you want to be a pretty experienced birder before taking on. It's definitely something that I am still learning. Uh, and for these, we do have a much more limited season. So these are the 7th of June to the 7th of July. And again, that's just because we want people out there when the maximum number of species are breeding. Point counts are the only information used to generate those abundance maps that I showed you uh, for the Manitoba Breeding Bird Atlas. So point counts didn't actually used to be a part of atlases at all. It's a relatively recent thing that they are, but they give us this really important information about abundance. And so it's something that we're, we're really pushing as part of the atlas. Uh, we look for 15 point counts per square. Um, and those square maps that I showed you will tell you how many of those point counts should be on road, which were the points that were already marked on the map, and how many should be off road. I'm going to leave the point count uh, information there. I think that many people will not want to participate in point counts. Uh, and I should also stress that if you sign up for a square, that doesn't mean that you have to do the point counts. You can sign up for just the general atlas. If you are able to do point counts, then we would really love to have you do them uh, because obviously this is a major limiting factor for us, the number of people who can go out and do point counts. And so please contact the regional coordinator of the regions you're gonna be atlasing in and let them know that you are willing and able to do point counts. Now, point counts are tricky. A lot of them are done involving birding by ear. And so we do actually have a workaround for this. Uh, and that is collecting bioacoustic information. So basically collecting audio recordings and using them to stand in for point counts. There are a couple of different ways that we do this. One is through handheld Zoom recorders. So if, for example, you'd like to maybe see whether you're ready to do point counts or you think you're ready to do point counts but you're not feeling, feeling completely confident, the regional coordinators will have these handheld Zoom recorders, which you take out in the field with you. You stand at the given point, whatever point you're trying to collect data, and you record the audio data. Obviously, if you can do point counts without these, it's preferred because audio recordings will have to be processed later. But if you're just, if you're interested in uh, backing up your information, you'd like to have a recording to listen to later, or you know you can't do point counts, perhaps um, I know that some of our volunteers have been losing their hearing and they, they definitely can't do point counts, but they're happy to take out a Zoom recorder and stand in a spot. So that is an option as well. And then the other thing I'm just going to mention briefly here is that we have these ARUs, Autonomous Recording Units, which is what you see in that picture there. And we are uh, getting industry partners, such as Cornerbrook Pulp and Paper and Fortis, to deploy those when they go out in the field this summer. And those recorders can just be left out in the field for several months, and they're programmed to turn on at specific times and collect audio information for us. So that's another way that we're going to collect point count information from some of our more remote areas where volunteers are unlikely to get. So what ties all of these types of data together is this breeding evidence that I keep mentioning. So atlasing is a little bit different than birding because we're interested not just in what species of birds you're seeing, but very much in what they're doing. So what can we extrapolate in terms of whether or not the species is breeding from what you see in the field? And obviously, if, for example, you come across a nest like this, uh, so that's a pipit nest, then you know for sure that pipits are breeding in that square. But we also don't, we're not in any way suggesting people need to go out and search for nests because there are a lot of behavioral cues that we can use to know whether something is breeding. So for example, this horned lark fledgling, he certainly hasn't, he, he's not able to fly very far. He's clearly very young. You can see uh, signs of the gape around the top of his beak there. So he's really good evidence that horned larks were breeding in that square. Um, this morning warbler carrying food, also really good evidence uh, that morning warbler is going to be carrying that food to a nestling in a nest. So that is confirmed breeding, even if you don't see the nest or the nestling. And even things like courtship displays can be really good evidence of breeding. Now, Gannets are, it's usually pretty easy to tell if gannets are breeding because they do so in very large numbers with very obvious nests. But generally speaking, a courtship display is also good evidence of breeding. And so what we use is this uh, standardized list of behavioral breeding evidence codes. 
Uh, there are three different levels. So we have possible breeding, probable breeding, and confirmed breeding. And that's what we want you to note down in the field in addition to the species you see. And so our goal for every species is to get the highest level of breeding evidence possible. That's, that's what we're looking for. Ideally, we wanna confirm breeding if we can for a species. So I'm not gonna go through all the breeding evidence codes because there are a lot of them and they are available on our website and on all of our data sheets. So you can take them out in the field with you. And if you use our app, they're also listed in the app. So you don't need to memorize them. You'll always have them with you, but I do wanna give you some examples. Uh, so observed is not actually breeding evidence at all. It means you observed a species during the breeding season. It wasn't in the right uh, nesting habitat and you don't have any evidence of breeding. So a really good example here is this ring-billed gull, probably in a McDonald's parking lot, let's be honest, that's where you see them. Um, and it's clearly not breeding at, McNa at McDonald's, uh, so you would just put an X. You saw a ring-billed gull in this square, you don't have any, ever, any further evidence of breeding. The first level of actual breeding evidence is possible, and there are only two codes in possible. There's habitat and singing. So habitat means you saw a species, it's in the right breeding habitat during the breeding season, and that's all you know. Singing is slightly better evidence of breeding. So you, you see a singing male or adult producing other sounds associated with breeding, so calls or drumming, uh, or for snipe, the, the snipe um, display, I'm blanking on the, the word right now, uh, but those of you that, that have heard the, the snipes uh, diving display where you hear the, the sound of the feathers that sounds an awful, winnowing, there we go, sounds an awful lot like boreal owls. That's another thing that you would use the S code for. Uh, and so the example I have here is uh, I took this picture of a savanna sparrow singing his little heart out at Cape St. Mary's a few years ago. So that's possible breeding. The next level up is probable breeding. Um, so the example I've chosen here is A agitated behavior or alarm calls of an adult in suitable nesting habitat during the species breeding season. Uh, and so a few years ago, I was in Gross Morn and saw this greater yellow legs perched at the top of a tree, which was funny to me because he really doesn't look like something that should be perching in trees. Uh, and he alarm called at us while we walked up, while we walked past, he alarm called for about 20 minutes. And so that would be probable breeding. He probably has a reason to be alarmed, but we didn't see any confirmed evidence of breeding. And then our final level is confirmed. And you'll note the code for this is CF. So all of the confirmed breeding codes are two letters. The possible and probable are single letters. And confirmed is things like this Wilson's warbler carrying food for young. Uh, so for passerines, if you see them carrying food, it's confirmed breeding usually. Okay, so now to wake you all up, I don't even know what time it is, 7.30, good timing. Um, we're gonna have a little quiz and you can type your answers into the uh, chat box or you can say them out loud if you like. So we're gonna start easy and then we're gonna get into some trickier ones. Uh, so a spot, young spot-breasted American Robin barely able to fly is seen hopping about on a lawn. So would the breeding code be X, H, F, Y, or N, Y? All right, come on, we can get more, more than two answers. Three, four, all right, we got five answers, any more? Okay, all right, so pretty much everybody agrees that this would be recently fledged or downy young, exactly. Um, so this guy, you know that he cannot have gone far. Uh, he was de definitely hatched nearby. The only time you need to be careful with things like FY is for species that you know travel a long way uh, after, after they fledge. Um, and certainly there are species like that. Um, ducks, black ducks, for example, will go three kilometers. Uh, we're still probably comfortable calling that fledged young. Something like a bald eagle though, you can see a young bald eagle and clearly it's, it, you know, we're not going to say that that's a fledged young because we're not confident that it's breeding nearby. Okay, a barn swallow is observed flying into a barn. And we're gonna assume that this is during the breeding season because we're unlikely to see a barn swallow in Newfoundland not during the breeding season. So is that X, H, V, or A, E? All right, one answer. Okay, we've got a V and an H. 
and then another V. Come on, we can do more than three answers. Okay, we've got a couple more V's and a couple H's. So we're a little bit more split on this one and I definitely get that, that's why I included it. Uh, so the correct answer here is actually V. So that's what we're looking for. Nope. Oh, okay. I'm seeing Edmund, I think you were drawing V's. That's interesting. I didn't know you could do that. Um, so because we know that barn swallows nest in barns, even without seeing a nest, we can assume that it's visiting a probable nest site. If we saw the nest, it would be an AE if we if we actually saw an adult sitting on a nest. And if I saw a barn swallow flying into a barn, I would probably go in and see what was going on there as long as it wasn't private property and I had permission to do so. Okay, Edmund, maybe stop drawing if that's okay and put it in the chat. I'm not quite sure how we, I wonder if we stop sharing and then we share again, maybe we can, uh, okay, let's see. Okay. All right, and uh, we scroll way down here to our quiz. Here's our barn swallow. Okay. All right, so next quiz uh, question is, you see a pair of ring-necked duck, ring ducks copulating during spring migration. So here is this an X, an H, a P, or a D. And answers in the chat, if you could. All right, I see a number of Ds. I see a C, so courtship display. I see a pair. A, Barry says it's A. Anybody have any different answers? Or any other answers at all? All right, so again, this is a bit of a tricky one. Uh, the correct answer is X. Does anyone know why the correct answer is X? Any guesses? I can't see if there's anything in the chat. Nope, don't see it. Uh, so you can unmute yourself if you have a guess as to why it's X. Barry, I think you said it was X. So do you wanna share with us why? Just to put you on the spot. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yep. Ducks often copulate in migration. That is exactly so. it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, because ducks will often pair up and copulate uh, long before they reach their breeding grounds, unless it's actually during the breeding season, you can't say that it is in fact uh, a copulation or a pair in that case um, or display. Um, so some of you may be asking, how do we know if it's exactly during the breeding season? We are currently hard at work on a document, which we'll be putting up on the website, uh, which uses information about nesting seasons in, in Newfoundland to kind of lay out what we consider safe breeding dates. And so that'll be really useful when you've got something like this. All right, thanks, Barry. All right, and one last question here. Uh, oh, no, sorry, I think I've got two more, I lied. Uh, so a house wren is seen carrying small twigs and hair into a nest box. And this one's kind of easy if you read the definitions of the possible answers there, but I did want to just highlight this. So is that D, V, N, or NB? All right, what have we got? Oh, we've got some NBs happening, but Eric says it's N. And another N. N, yeah. So those of you who called it N, you are absolutely correct. This was a bit of a trick question as well. Uh, so N is nest building or excavation by a wren or a woodpecker. NB is nest building or excavation of a nest hole by anything else. 
Um, what is the main difference between N and NB? We've got a single letter code and a double letter code. What's our difference there? Anyone? What do the double letter codes mean? Come on, help me out guys. Prove that I'm not talking to myself. Double letter codes mean? Confirm breeding. Confirm breeding, yes, you got it. So nest building by anything that isn't a woodpecker or a wren is confirmed breeding. Nest building by a wren or a woodpecker is not confirmed breeding. Anyone know why? This one you don't have to answer just yes, but you got it. Eric, that's exactly it. They build decoy nests. Uh, so wrens and woodpeckers will actually build these fake nests. And so just because you see one excavating a cavity or building a nest doesn't actually mean they're breeding there. So that's why you have that difference. And that's, that's really what I wanted to, to highlight there. So the answer to this question is N and that's a good one to remember. Okay, and this really is the last question. So an American crow is observed carrying food in its bill in May. Is that an X, an H, a D, or a CF? Okay, we've got an X from Megan, X from both Megans. Okay, D or C, CF. Anyone else care to venture a guess? Okay, D. So carrying food. Another X. Okay, so again with the tricky questions, uh, this is the answer that the quiz gives. I would argue that you could have an X or an H depending on where you saw it and what time of year it was at. However, just about everywhere is suitable habitat for crows to breed. Uh, they're pretty versatile. Um, it is not carrying food. And the reason that it's not carrying food is because things like crows uh, and also some gulls and terns will carry their food long distances before eating it. So just because one of these species is carrying food does not necessarily mean they're carrying it for the young. And so that's the key thing there. And really this leads us really nicely into this idea of questionable codes. Uh, so a lot of the time the breeding code to use is straightforward. You'll also probably find yourself using H and S a lot, those possible codes, which is fine. Um, but ideally, obviously, we want to get the highest level of breeding evidence possible. So invalid codes are things that the system will not accept. Uh, and those are things that aren't necessarily impossible, but are quite unlikely. So if, for example, you were to say nest building for a brown-headed cowbird, which is a nest parasite, the system will say, mm, I don't think so. Uh, so the system will not accept that code uh, because brown-headed cowbirds don't build nests. Uh, carrying food for most precocial species, so species where the young are out of the nest very quickly, they don't usually carry food to them. And so the, the system will give you a hard time about that as well. Then we have this whole other category of codes, which are improbable codes. And these are things that the system, as you go to enter the data, it will give you a warning about this, but it doesn't mean that it could never happen. And some of these are a little bit trickier. So we have that CF code. Uh, so for things like the American crow uh, that carry food for themselves and their young, or even things that feed their mates during courtship, um, it's not that you didn't see that species carrying food, it's just that that may not mean what you think it means. Uh, and so the system will give you a warning about that. Um, similarly, there's this NU code, which is confirmed breeding. It's a double letter code. Um, but uh, so it means that you see eggshells or used nests, basically. And the reason that the system is going to warn you about this is, again, not that it doubts that you found eggshells or, used, or a used nest, but a lot of those nests and eggshells aren't unique. So you can't always tell what species you've got just by looking at a nest or just by looking at an eggshell. And actually, uh, Kathy and I did have a discussion about this relatively recently, uh, where she found some robin eggshells, which are pretty unique. Uh, and so that was an appropriate use of the NU code. And um, the other thing about NU is it can be very difficult to tell if a nest was used within the same season. 
so that's the other thing. It, it assumes that what you're finding uh, pertains to that breeding season. And that can be quite difficult to tell towards the end of the summer. Uh, there are some species for which we ask for a little bit of extra documentation. And there are three categories of species where we're looking for a bit more. Um, those are species that are provincially rare. So those are coded with a single cross. Things that are regionally rare, so things that we know breed on the island of Newfoundland but haven't been seen before in the region that you're birding in will come up with a double cross. And then this sort of all-purpose species of interest category, which here in Newfoundland largely means colonial breeders, um, which is a bit of, bit of an unfortunate thing because we do have so many colonial breeders. For the provincially rare and the regionally rare species, uh, we need extra documentation required for any information. So it doesn't matter if you have possible breeding, probable breeding or confirmed breeding, we always want more information because we wanna know, you know, we want the evidence that backs up your sighting. Uh, and then for these colonial nesters, the widespread species at risk, we only need extra documentation for confirmed breeding. So those double letter codes, that's when we're looking for extra documentation. When I say extra documentation, what I mean is things like a description of the bird or the colony so that uh, we have some idea what you saw, the habitat that it was seen in, how familiar you as a birder are with the species. Uh, you know, there are people who bird in Newfoundland um, who if they told me they saw a great auk, I'd be inclined to believe them regardless of the fact the species is extinct. Uh, and then there are people who are newer. And so in that case, we might question a little bit more. Um, the observation conditions, are, are really important as well. So how was the weather? How was the lighting? How long did you see this bird? There's a huge difference between seeing something for a fleeting three seconds and seeing something for three minutes. Uh, we want more specific location information for these sightings. Uh, so you can either mark them on your square map, which has uh, those really nice grid lines on it, and that can be really helpful. Or if you have a GPS or uh, if you're in cell coverage, you can take a point. And that's really what we're looking for there. Uh, and then if anybody else saw it with you, and obviously the holy grail with these species is to have a photo or an audio recording. So if you are in a position to do that, that can be incredibly helpful. We have to be a little bit careful with this because obviously we want to make sure that the atlas uh, is based on very high quality data. That's really important. And so that's kind of what we're, we're looking to ensure here. But at the same time, we don't know everything that's here. If we knew everything that was here and everywhere it was found, we wouldn't need to do an atlas. Uh, so with these records, we're not saying, you know, people didn't see what they think they saw. We're just really looking to get the best evidence possible. Although if anybody does see a great auk, I would be very surprised. Um, okay, so really all of this is building ultimately towards a map like this. So again, I showed you this at the beginning for Bobolink. This is a map for the Northern Flicker in Manitoba, although that picture was taken in Newfoundland. And you get a map where you see each square color coded there by uh, whether we found possible breeding, probable breeding, confirmed breeding, and then there are some squares that were not surveyed. So those are white. And then the gray squares were surveyed, but flickers were not observed. So that's what we're aiming towards. And we're moving towards the end here. I'll just, yeah, we're pretty much right on time. Um, but I really, I wanted to take a minute to consider what the benefits of an atlas are. So obviously this is a phenomenal amount of work uh, for volunteer citizen scientists, for Birds Canada, for all of our partners. And so why are we doing this? And the first thing is atlases are a great way to monitor and evaluate ecosystem health. So they're pretty cost effective. Um, it's a huge effort, but it involves so many different people that it is actually pretty cost effective. They're scientifically rigorous and they're repeatable. Atlases are designed to be repeated every 20 years. And so some of you may know that Ontario is actually just starting this summer, their third breeding bird atlas. And what that lets us do is track what's going on with bird populations over time. Uh, so here you can see the map of probability of observation for barn swallows uh, in the Maritimes Breeding Bird Atlas, in the first atlas there, which was done between 1986 and 1990, and then in the second atlas, which was done between 2006 and 2010. And just looking right at those, you can see that you were much, much less likely to encounter a barn swallow during the second atlas than you were during the first atlas, particularly in New Brunswick. And uh, so the third map there just shows you the difference which is, is pretty obvious just from the maps. 
Um, it's not always a bad news story. So uh, this is the same maps for the blue-headed vireo. And from these maps, you can see that you are actually more likely to encounter a blue-headed vireo during the second atlas than you were during the first atlas. But these maps really give you an idea of just how useful atlases are to keep track of what's going on with bird populations. And because of that, because they tell us where species are and how the populations are doing, they're a really powerful conservation tool. So we can use these to inform public policy and to influence decisions about land management at multiple scales. So academics use atlases, but so do governments, so do uh, various industries, um, so do consultants when they're conducting environmental impact assessments. Atlases are useful to everyone. And then finally, and this is a really important goal of the Atlas, it's a great way to get people outside and enthused about birds. So part of what we're trying to do is grow the community of birders. We want people to be excited about this. It's a really cool project. So some of you may have noted that I mentioned this is our second year of data collection. Our first year was 2020 and we had a very nicely laid out timeline. Uh, we were gonna launch, have a big launch event last May and uh, do our five years of data collection. Um, obviously we encountered the exact same wrench in our plans as everybody else did. Uh, we did not have a major launch event last May and pretty much all of our outreach to date has been virtual as for everyone else. And actually at the beginning of last spring, we weren't sure that any atlasing at all would happen. Uh, we, were, we were not really sure what was gonna happen at all with the atlas last summer. Uh, last, around this time, well, or at mid-March last year, Birds Canada put all citizen sur science surveys on hold because we didn't want to encourage traveling unnecessarily. And uh, even when things kind of started to come back in, you know, May, we were encouraging atlasers to atlas their own neighborhoods and backyards to not go very far afield. But then as things kind of continued to relax over the summer, people did start to travel more and we ended up getting a lot more information uh, than we were actually expecting last summer. So this is our map showing the total number of species. All of those colored squares are places where we do have some coverage. Uh, so we were really actually blown away uh, by the participation of citizen scientists last year in Newfoundland. And I think these stats are a couple weeks old now, but last summer we had 96 volunteers registered. We had over a thousand hours of atlasing in 275 squares. Um, each time you submit data, you submit it in the form of a checklist and we had almost 1400 checklists submitted and we have information about 145 species. So 145 observed species, which is really phenomenal. Um, obviously, you'll see that a lot of that coverage is centered around some of the major population areas. So getting out to remote squares uh, was a challenge last summer. It will continue to be a challenge this summer, but we're hoping to start tackling some of that. How do you join the Atlas? So Wayne, I believe this was your question. Uh, you can sign up for the Atlas by going to our website there. Uh, so I've written it down there. I will also send out an email with that link after the presentation. And what you wanna do is click that little login button on the top. Uh, it gets a little bit confusing. This site you see here is our WordPress site and it has lots of lots of information about the Atlas, lots of background stuff. Uh, it's where we'll be putting our blog with stories from Atlasers. It tells you all about the Atlas, but it's not where we keep our data or our participant records. That is the nature count site. So when you click on that login button, you'll get taken to this site. What you wanna do is click the sign up. Uh, so you'll click sign up and essentially you will create an account in Nature Counts. Nature Counts is Birds Canada's data management system. It's where the data from virtually all of our programs goes. We have our own Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas page on this uh, database. The other thing you can find on Nature Counts are those Atlas Square resources I mentioned. So those square maps that I showed you, this is where you go to get them. So if you go to resources there, pick Atlas Square resources, and then you have a number of ways to pick the square that you wanna get information about. Um, but the easiest way is to just scroll in until you're pretty close up with, to the location that you're looking for. Uh, so I scrolled in on Salmonier Nature Park there. Uh, the, the blue points are the point count locations. The uh, flames are eBird hotspots. So one of the things we've been working really hard on is integrating the Atlas with eBird because we know a lot of people really like to use eBird. 
I'm not going to get into that now, but we do have a data entry workshop this Thursday and also next Thursday where we'll be talking about how you can use eBird to put your information into the Atlas. The neat thing here is that you can download that PDF map, so that square map that I showed you, which will have all the point count locations on it and the habitat uh, breakup. You can also download the coordinates of the point counts and you can download them as a CSV file or a GPX file uh, and those can go into Google Maps or they can go into a GPS device and help you find those point count loca locations in the field. Uh, and then you can um, look at the square species list and the square summary sheet, which basically show you the highest level of breeding evidence that's been reported for the species in those squares. So you know that uh, you know, you're aiming to obviously always increase uh, the breeding evidence uh, every time you go out. So it's useful to know what people have seen so far. The last thing I want to emphasize is really this idea that anyone can Atlas. So, uh, you know, a lot of people will find the Atlas very overwhelming. Uh, they'll feel that they are not a strong enough birder to contribute. And this is something that I completely understand uh, because I have a background in bird behavior, but I'm still learning to be a birder myself. So I totally understand feeling overwhelmed. But it's good to remember that you probably know more about birds than you think you do. Uh, so for example, pretty much everyone is going to recognize an American robin. And that is our current species distribution map for the American robin there. Uh, and you can see that there are squares all over the island where we don't have any breeding evidence for American robins. So if you happen to live in one of those squares or have a ca cabin in one of those squares and you see a breeding American robin, that is super useful information to contribute to the atlas. Similarly, a lot of you guys will recognize this guy, the horned lark. They're quite common in Newfoundland. Uh, they really like this sort of barrens areas. They like those wide open areas. They're easily recognizable, horned larks are. Uh, they're relatively easy to see because they do like the barren areas, so they're usually down on the ground. Uh, and we know that there are horned larks breeding in way more squares than you see on that map there. I think we have horned larks recorded in something like, I think, what is that, 10 squares, nine squares, and I know we can do better than that. And anybody can see a horned lark, uh, especially one like this carrying food, which would be confirmed breeding, and contribute that to the atlas. So really, even if you're a beginning birder, you can absolutely make a valuable con uh, contribution. The key thing that we want beginning birders to remember is if you're not sure, actually all birders to remember, if you're not sure about what you saw, don't submit it. So if in doubt, leave it out. Only submit records for which you are absolutely certain. Um, bird ethically, this typically means that you don't want to harass the birds, uh, you don't want to get too close, you don't want to bait them. Um, we generally do not suggest the use of playback to call birds in. There are exceptions to that and we do know that some people use it. Um, but usually we, we say just be aware of um, sort of minimizing disturbance to the birds. And there is a statement about ethical birding on our website. If you're going on private land, always get permission. Uh, be respectful to other birders, to the birds themselves, to private landowners. Uh, be safe and have fun. So really, we're hoping that you will join us in this massive effort to put Newfoundland birds on the map. And I will leave it there. That is the Birds Canada website, the Atlas website, and our email. And I will open it up to questions now.